All right, everyone, we're going to get started. It's 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar titled Militarism in the Media. We are recording this webinar and it will be available for viewing anytime after this as well. My name is Greta Zaro and I'm World Beyond War's Organizing Director. World Beyond War is a grassroots global network of volunteers, activists, and allied organizations advocating for the abolition of war and its replacement with an alternative global security system based on peace and demilitarization. These webinars are available for free thanks to the generous support of our donors. Um, our work is funded by individuals around the world who give small dollar donations and you can help keep these webinars free by going to worldbeyondwar.org slash donate. Today's webinar will feature two speakers discussing the role of the media in promoting war and violence. Our speakers tonight are Rose Dyson. Rose, if you want to wave your hand. Rose has a background in psychiatric nursing and a BA and MED in psychology and counseling. Her doctorate on violence in the media and cultural policy One moment, I'm scrolling down, sorry. Her doctorate was followed by her book, Mind Abuse, Media Violence in an Information Age. She is the president of Canadians Concerned About Violence in Entertainment. Our second speaker tonight is Jeff Cohen. Co-founder of Roots Action, Jeff is a media critic, writer, and journalism professor who founded the media watch group FAIR in 1986. Jeff, can you wave your hand and say hello? Hello, everybody. For years, he was a regular pundit on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, discussing issues of media and politics. He is the author of Cable News Confidential, My Misadventures in Corporate Media. Thanks for joining us tonight, and we have over 50 participants on this call. Thank you, everyone. So we'll start with a panel discussion. I have some questions for Rose and for Jeff, and we'll alternate and go back and forth. And then um, after that, we'll have an open discussion in Q&A, which will be moderated by Mark Elliott Stein. Mark, if you want to raise your hand. Mark is a volunteer and coordinating committee member uh, with World Beyond War. So at this point, everyone is muted except for our speakers. And then we'll unmute at the end and tell you how you can raise your hand and ask questions. All right, so let's get started. Um, Rose, we'll start with you. Rose, you say that popular culture, TV, music, social media, video games, for example, glamorizes violence, guns, and warfare. Can you give some specific examples of this? Yes, well, war themes in films and uh, television programs have uh, for years celebrated uh, bravery, heroism, power, and adventure. These repeat themselves over and over again in video games like World of Warcraft, Assassin's Creed, and Call of Duty. They are played by millions of, uh, around the world today and spill over uh, into social media in behavior such as cyberbullying and uh, sexual harassment. All of this is accelerated in recent years with the digital revolution and increasing importance of information in our lives. But it is not only popular culture that is being aggressively marketed uh, to all of us, but lifestyle as well. Um, consider for, uh, some of the coverage uh, uh, about war movies like Collateral Damage, which were uh, pulled from distribution immediately following 9-11, but not for long. Uh, it, it was reported at the time that uh, something like 270 terrorist films produced and distributed by Hollywood in the previous two decades involved Arabs cast as the villains and Americans as the world's benevolent policemen. Now, let me give you a, a, a more recent example of how normalized uh, um, all kinds of deviant uh, violent behavior has become. Last week, there was an opinion piece in the Globe and Mail, uh, Canada's national newspaper, on popular contemporary musician R. Kelly, who has been dogged by allegations of sexual misconduct and violence involving minors throughout his entire very successful career. But he 
he has experienced virtually no repercussions and continues to accumulate all kinds of awards. He has uh, had only um, the odd irritant when prosecutors have brought forward charges against him, most of which have been dropped, and although some radio stations have cut him out of their catalogs. But now there is a new doc documentary, six parts, uh, no less, that uh, are, are attracting a huge audiences called Surviving R. Kelly, based on recycled news about women being locked up and denied food for days on end, an illegal marriage to a minor, parents pleading on behalf of missing children, charges of child pornography, uh, cash for violence and settlements with some women, and on it goes. But R. Kelly's lyrics and fame as a musician in involving this kind of behavior is not unique. He is by no means the first whose depravity has been flouted and celebrated for its outrageousness. We've had musicians like Marilyn Manson and Ozzy Osbourne in the past whose uh, lyrics have been celebrated and mimicked. In Toronto, back in 1993, when CK, this is the organization I chair, objected to such lyrics uh, being aired on city TV, they responded by producing their own award-winning TV special. Um, a documentary was called In Your Face, Violence in Music, and declared it educational because they included some footage on harmful effects based on an interview they did with myself. Uh, but uh, discontinuing such entertainment entirely was deemed out of the question because of its appeal to a younger generation. The point is, Kelly's expert manipulation in making people laugh at and with him and his victims by, by in his case, interjecting the odd gospel-tinged ballad and having all forgiven is a well-worn trick within the media. As long as a lot of people are making money, the inclination is to have it both ways. Um, another example of how popular culture glorifies violence was discussed a couple of days ago also in the Globe by John Doyle, who expressed relief that the TV series Criminal Minds, which has run on CBS for 15 seasons now, only has another 10 episodes left. Like so many others over the years, it has fetishized uh, kidnapping, subjugation, and torture with audiences enthralled by gruesome murders and mesmerized by scenes of helpless females being rescued by outstanding males in the FBI. I think Doyle is right when he says that thematic, uh, this such thematic material is perverse and out of date, but it seems clear that an appetite for such entertainment in the North American psyche at large is a problem that prevents us from moving to a world beyond war. So I'll stop there, Ron, unless you want me to comment further. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. Yeah, we'll have more time to delve into that. Um, let's move on to Jeff for the second question. Jeff, can you talk about your experience working as a TV pundit on mainstream outlets like CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, while at the same time you were advocating against the invasion of Iraq? What was the reaction of your bosses and colleagues to your arguments against military invasion? Well, I've written uh, a couple chapters about this in my book, Cable News Confidential, that came out in 2006. And um, I spent 2002 and three largely at MSNBC, owned by uh, General Electric at the time. Now it's owned by Comcast, and it's part of NBC News. And every afternoon I had a debate with a different right winger. It was my segment. And as we got closer to the invasion of Iraq, a lot of the debates were about whether we should invade Iraq. And I remember once uh, during one of those debates where I said, well, the focus is supposed to be on these terrorists who killed so many innocent civilians in 9-11, and one needs Arab and Muslim governments to help uh, bring those criminals to justice. Uh, how can we be doing that while we're invading this other country, Iraq, that had nothing to do with 9-11? And I remember the moderator of the debate, who's now the uh, anchor of NBC Nightly News, Lester Holt, he said something like, well, can't we walk and chew gum at the same time? Um, at a certain point, as we got closer to the invasion, I lost my airtime. I was taken off the air. They had to make room for a new program called Countdown Iraq, 
which was hosted by Lester Holt. And it just featured a steady parade of retired admirals, retired generals, retired colonels, retired CIA chiefs. And we now look back on what they said. And by the way, they were never in debates. They were never asked tough questions. And these, uh, these, this parade of military brass, we look back on what they said on how uh, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. We have to invade and invade now. Uh, the invasion will be quick and we will immediately, you know, we might be out within weeks or months. All of that stuff looks, you know, would be laughable if it weren't so serious for all the hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians who've been killed from Afghanistan to Iraq. Uh, but that's how I got taken off the air. But besides having an on-air job at MSNBC, and remember, it's considered the left-wing alternative to Fox News. It is not now, nor has it ever been a progressive channel. But uh, besides being on the air, I was a senior producer on the most watched program on MSNBC at the time, which was Phil Donahue's primetime show. And as we got closer to the invasion of Iraq, management took over our program. When, when, we, when Phil Donahue and I went over to MSNBC, it was on the condition that we would have control over our own show. But we never did. And as we got closer to Iraq, they imposed a closer to the invasion. Management at MSNBC, and some of these guys are still there, management imposed a quota system on us. They said if we ever had a guest who was questioning the wisdom of this impending invasion of Iraq, we had to have two that were pro-war. If we had two guests that were on the left, we had to book three guests during that segment, featured on that segment, who were on the right. And at one meeting, a producer he thought he could book Michael Moore, who was a very vocal critic of the impending invasion. She was told she'd have to have three right-wingers to balance Michael Moore. So even though they had imposed this pro-war bias, and it came from the top, it came from management, some of those people are still at MSNBC and NBC News, and um, it wasn't enough that they biased our show, and because once in a while we were still getting some journalism in there, we were still getting some skeptics on the Phil Donahue primetime show on MSNBC. So three weeks before the invasion of Iraq, they took us off the air. And they immediately started lying to reporters who cover television and said, yeah, it's sad Donahue had to go because of poor ratings. And God bless whistleblowers because within a day of us being terminated at the Phil Donahue show, an internal memo was leaked by some whistleblower who had access to the upper reaches of NBC. So an internal memo came out from uh, NBC and it said this, uh, Donahue uh, represents, quote, a difficult public face for NBC in a time of war. He seems to delight in presenting guests who are anti-war, anti-Bush, and skeptical of the administration's motives, unquote. And, you know, it's my understanding, and I was a journalism professor, that the idea of media and journalism in a free society, in a democracy, is that you do question the motives of those in power, but not when this war was impending and the war on terrorism, so-called, had already begun. This internal memo went on to say uh, that they feared that Donahue's show would become a home for the liberal anti-war agenda at the same time that our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity, unquote. So what did MSNBC do? They took Donahue off the air and they started waving the flag. And what we learned from that era is that if journalists are busy waving flags, they don't have the energy to do their jobs, which is to ask tough questions of those in power before our young men and women are sent over to kill or be killed. That's the lesson. And when my book came out, Cable News Confidential, I realized this didn't just happen to us. At local media, regional media, national media, there was one person after another who lost their job or censored because they were trying to do journalism in a time of war. 
And, and that's the sad uh, tale of the end of my television news career. That brings me to a follow-up question for you, Jeff. And before we go any further, I just want to acknowledge that we have 100 people on this webinar, which is really exciting. Um, so there's a quote from you, Jeff, that I think is really good. You say, quote, we can have raging debates in mainstream media about issues like gun control and gay marriage and minimum wage. But when the elites of both parties agree on military intervention, as they so often do, debate is nearly non-existent. Why? Why do you think that both major political parties and major news outlets turn a blind eye to this singular issue of militarism? Well, uh, the military industrial complex it does a good job of funding the leadership of both political parties, both major parties. Uh, but the problem in the media is a problem of what journalism professors call official source journalism, where you believe that your job as a journalist is to reflect what the elites, the governing elites, the leaders of the two major parties are saying. And when there's a run up to an invasion of Iraq, for example, and George Bush, a Republican, is pushing it, and the Democratic leadership, Senator Harry Reid, Senator John Kerry, Senator John Edwards, Senator Hillary Clinton, Senator Joe Biden, they're all pushing for the invasion along with the Republican president. Well, then there's no debate. And in the mainstream media, if the two parties aren't debating something, then they don't debate anything. And in, uh, I know from my experience working at MSNBC in particular, a tiny bit uh, I, I used to be on air at CNN, is if you say something to a top editor or manager, look, the major parties aren't debating something, but this exorbitant military budget needs to be debated and I've got experts and academics who say it's outrageous and, and I'd love to do a report on that. You'd be accused of being liberal biased because you're, uh, Jeff, our job here isn't to create news. Our job is to report the news. And by report the news, they mean be an echo chamber or a megaphone for the leadership of the two major parties. And I'll give one final example, and that's the military budget. Um, when there's no debate among the elites, the leadership of the two parties, Donald Trump, you'll remember, demanded an 11% increase in an already bloated military budget. And he wanted an 11% increase over two years. And during the beginning of 2018, there's a negotiation going on between the major parties. And here's what Nancy Pelosi said in an email to House Democrats, quote, in our negotiations, congressional Democrats have been fighting for increases in funding for defense, unquote. And then Chuck Schumer, his office, put out this statement. We fully support President Trump's Defense Department's request. Remember, Trump is asking for money that even the Defense Department doesn't want and didn't ask for. So when you have the situation where the leadership of the two parties is not having a debate. Keep in mind that Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, they oppose the increase in military spending, but they're considered backbenchers. And so it's, it's a problem of official source journalism uh, where military spending, and, and remember so many of the sponsors of the news are military contractors. That's an issue that's off limits. Uh, you know, in the mainstream media, you can debate gay marriage and guns and things like that till you're blue in the face, but the military budget has always been off limits. And part of the problem is there's not opposition from the uh, leadership of the Democratic Party and the mainstream media too often sees itself, as Amy Goodman's always saying, if we had state media, how different would it really be? Well, talking about the issue of the profitability of war brings me to my next question for Rose this time. Rose, you say that violence feeds the bottom line. Why do you think that violence sells? And if we could make violence not profitable, do you think that the media would stop promoting it? Well, psychologists tell us that as humans, we are genetically programmed to respond to stimuli involving sex and violence. Sex is equated with pleasure, love, and, and life, violence with danger, fear, and death. 
These have always been staples in popular culture or in cultural entertainment, but are now cleverly exploited by producers because they are cheap commercial ingredients that sell well in a global economy and translate easily into any language. In the last century, boundaries were relaxed and eventually eliminated entirely um, by film review boards throughout North America. Uh, this has coincided with increased importance and worldwide appeal uh, of popular culture uh, along with its growing economic impact. Uh, evidence of harmful effects has been consistently ignored uh, with industry funded studies usually uh, coinciding with a release from the medical community or psychological community uh, which constantly uh, where they're constantly beating the drum of inconclusive results ensuring business as usual. Um, meanwhile more and more people have become addicted to pornography, violent and otherwise, video games and other forms of screen time. The same phenomena that was so well described in a documentary, I don't know if you people saw it, it was quite widely distributed uh, a few years ago, um, Merchants of Doubt, um, um, based on a book by that same title by a couple of scientists based, I think, at the University of Pennsylvania, about how corporate interests fudge the scientific findings on climate change in the same way that used to be done by the tobacco industry. Uh, now, this has and continues continues to happen on the harmful effects of violence in popular culture. Uh, frequent reports surface on how video games are now one of the best investments you can make in the stock market. Why? Because like tobacco, they are very addictive. And um, I think... Um, 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 Well, we also hear a great deal. I don't know, uh, Greta, if you were going to ask me this question, but I had my notes from you originally that um, um, I have often pointed out that video games uh, are very highly subsidized, and, and, uh, and that's true throughout North America. Um, they have um, um, been funded to some extent uh, and scripted by uh, U.S. military, and, and we hear a great deal, uh, of course, about the military industrial complex, but the term really should be expanded uh, to milita military industrial entertainment complex. Um, at times uh, and, uh, when military spending has been reduced, not often as Jeff has pointed out, but occasionally it has been, uh, there have been reports uh, of soldiers um, gravitating to Hollywood to help put their uh, stories and experiences on screens. Uh, so for decades uh, we've known uh, 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 now uh, that uh, video games uh, are used to train soldiers uh, to kill with impunity. U.S. Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman is someone who's written extensively on the subject and pointed out the dangers of using the Pavlovian training techniques the military used to reward soldiers for blowing uh, heads off as indiscriminate entertainment for young people the world over. And he's warned that this has uh, led to uh, what he calls AVIDs or Acquired Violence Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Uh, George Gerbner, whom we uh, uh, mentioned uh, earlier in conversation with Jeff, um, uh, used to call it uh, the uh, um, a hidden curriculum for a mean world syndrome. And we are, of course, now at this juncture in our human history, seeing uh, all kinds of evidence of these inclinations in uh, election campaigns with death threats and uh, vows to uh, lock her up, hurl the female candidate. Um, uh, these are now common and they're happening in Canada and other parts of the world besides uh, the U.S. Uh, so the synergy between the military and the video game industry uh, uh, was also illustrated in another recent documentary titled uh, Drones, um, which told the story of how military recruitment takes place at video game conferences. It has also dealt uh, this particular film uh, or documentary with the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder suffered by soldiers uh, engaged in drone warfare. So it's not only uh, the soldiers who are in um, uh, active war zones that uh, uh, experience these problems. Thank you, Rose. So I have a concluding question for you both, and then we'll open up to the audience participation in Q&A. 
The question for you both is, can you give some concrete recommendations for how we can be peaceful advocates for a world beyond war, and in particular, how we can, quote, demilitarize the media? Well, I'd be happy to start. Um, we can get governments to eliminate uh, tax credits and subsidies for popular culture, uh, cultural products uh, that celebrate violence. In both Canada and the U.S., it has been reported that the video game industry is one of the most highly subsidized in North America. A more careful scrutiny is required on the part of those doling out money for what they call arts funding. It's usually very couched in benign terms, um, the requests for this kind of, uh, these kind of subsidies and for innovation. Uh, too often the money ends up where it is least needed and fuels harmful effects in a, in a number of different ways. And there's also a great deal of hypocrisy that pervades the production and distribution of questionable practices in all media industries. Uh, we need to uh, step up the Me Too movement and pay closer attention to the reporters, both male and female, who occasionally focus attention on the irony involved in outrage over sexual harassment in the workplace, but seeming cluelessness about the educational uh, impact of such behavior marketed as just entertainment. We hear a great deal these days on CNN and elsewhere about how words matter. Well, if they matter in political rhetoric, they have to matter in education and information as well. And much more attention must be paid to differences between individual freedom of expression and corporate freedom of enterprise. These two have been confused for decades under the guise of truisms like the public right to know or slippery slope arguments about the danger of any restrictions on any kind of media leading to censorship. Um, and what I believe is naive faith in net neutrality and allowing market-driven uh, digital giants to decide what we should see, hear, and read. In, uh, in other words, allowing the fox to guard the hen houses. I certainly believe in stricter gun control legislation and restrictions, uh, but what we need in, in, in that debate or that public discourse is more attention to the need for restrictions on glamorization of uh, ownership and use of guns. That um, a, a, a component uh, tends to get lost in, in demands for um, stricter gun control, in my view, and that's unfortunate. Um, legislation banning as to children 13 years and under in order to reduce the, the, the growing commercial exploitation of them. Uh, this is long overdue. It's been in effect in the province of Quebec for over 20 years. Most developed democracies have it uh, in Europe and um, Australia and New Zealand. English Canada and the U.S. are actually lagging behind in this. I would point out that we have uh, um, a bill right now in the House of Commons in Ottawa that's uh, up for third reading and um, I'm among those that's cautiously optimistic that we're finally going to get some uh, education in this education in this context. And finally, more production and distribution of documentaries like Screenagers, which came out two or three years ago. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. If you aren't, I strongly encourage you to um, uh, investigate it. It's um, um, what it does is depend depicts the devastating impact of digital addictions among the young and what health professionals are saying about this and hand-wringing parents as well. But there should be far more emphasis in that kind of film or, or a film that focuses on harmful effects on the need for corporate responsibility and better governance. And finally, I think it's important that there are more demands coming from the public at large, peace activists, health professionals and educators for greater corporate accountability and credible cultural policy. Too often, the role of media in trying to bring about uh, uh, social change uh, is, um, um, I think, overlooked and, and not really discussed beyond what kind of uh, better coverage we can get. And that, of course, is very important, but there's, there's a great deal more to what the media involves in terms of lifestyle marketing and so on. So, Jeff, yeah. <laughs> over to you. Okay. Uh, it's an honor to uh, be working with uh, World Beyond War tonight in this webinar. I have such respect for the activism there. Um, but I would argue that if you're a peace activist, you also have to be a media activist. And if you're a progressive media activist, there's two main areas of content. 
of, of action uh, in the area of news media. One is it's part of your job as a media activist to promote independent news outlets and sources that give a more fair and accurate picture of war and peace issues. And in everything you do as an activist um, and, and in social media and with your neighbors and your relatives and, is to promote independent news outlets that you trust. That's number one, whether it's the nation.com or the intercept or truth dig, truth out, common dreams. There's so many great journalistic sources that are so much better than on these war and peace issues, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, et cetera, et cetera, CNN, MSNBC. So that's your first job is promote independent outlets. And number two is to challenge the mainstream outlets because they have the eyeballs and the ears of millions of people. And that challenge making demands on mainstream media to include a peace point of view to have this person from this magazine balance that person from the uh, national review warmongering magazine it's the kind of work that you can easily do by going to the website fair.org i started the media watch group fair in 1986 and if you're doing the second part of media activism, which is hound dogging the mainstream media, it's great to do it with FAIR. If you go on the website and click on take action, you'll see that FAIR is regularly putting out action alerts. And in no time, in a matter of hours, FAIR can generate thousands of individually written emails to targets, to media targets. And some of these over the decades, and I was there from 86 till uh, 2000, we have gotten vo voices on the air who otherwise would not have been on the air. Uh, we have gotten segments done that otherwise would not have been done. Have we got these mainstream outlets to say, hey, we've been warmongers for 30 years and now we're gonna be for peace. No, that's never gonna happen. But in the process of hound dogging mainstream media, you're doing a few things. Uh, one, you're occasionally winning and getting a new viewpoint on the air. Two, you're helping to delegitimize corporate mainstream media by making demands on them and, and exposing what they have done. And it's good to do that with FAIR because in the action alerts, FAIR provides you with the statistics, the talking points that you can then go to the mainstream media and make demands as well as go to uh, fellow citizens. I'll give you one example of an action alert. Uh, FAIR did a little survey in July of last year where they found for the previous year on MSNBC, they had not done a segment on the US role in the war on Yemen. They had not done the US war on Yemen for a whole year. And uh, FAIR's uh, action alert pointed out to its thousands of activists that during that same year, they had done 455 segments on the porn star Stormy Daniels. So when you're armed with that kind of data that FAIR can provide, that you, know, you will get MSNBC to cover in a couple segments Yemen. Does that mean that we've converted a pro-war outlet to an anti-war outlet? No, but does it help in our building peace consciousness and anti-war groups and anti-war movements to do this kind of organizing, I would definitely say yes. Great, thank you so much. So now we'll open up to audience participation and Q&A um, for anyone who has questions for Rose and Jeff. So if you're calling in with your telephone, you can press star nine, that's star nine, which will toggle a little indicator on our end to let us know that you're raising your hand to ask a question. If you're dialing in through your computer screen, um, you can either put your question right in the chat box, um, or you can also raise your hand as well. And Mark, I'll let you explain that and Mark will be moderating this Q&A portion. Okay, hi everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Um, so yeah, as, as Greta said, if you're on your phone, um, star nine will, will raise your hand. And if you're on your computer, you should see in your controls a little raise hand icon. 
So if somebody wants to raise their hand right now, we actually have two people lined up with questions, um, but the rest of you can go ahead and raise your hand. And um, the first question we have, and I'm gonna direct this to both of you. Why don't we go in the same order, um, Rose first and then Jeff. So this is from Don. Is there any hope to make alliances with anti-war Republicans, Libertarians, and some Tea Party people? Um, obviously talking in the context of the United States here. You know, this is international, but um, Rose, do you want to take that? I think you're muted, Rose. You're unmuted now, Rose. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, would you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. Uh, Sure, this is from Don, and it's, is there any hope to make alliances with anti-war Republicans, Libertarians, and some Tea Party people? Well, um, as uh, Mark says, I think that's a question that is probably best answered by an American. I, uh, uh, um, I, I, as a matter of fact, as a Canadian watching a lot of CNN and the uh, coverage and uh, commentary on uh, war budgets, uh, there is, of course, a lot of opposition to Trump having decided to pull out of uh, um, the, the uh, Syria, I think it is, or the parts of the Middle East. Uh, uh, how um, uh, does that indicate uh, the possibility of some uh, hope in uh, aligning with Republicans or Tea Party people who might uh, uh, want to see um, uh, America disengaging itself from uh, its traditional role as the world's policeman? Yeah, I, I think it's the point that uh, Donald Trump as the president uh, is crazy, unstable, generally militaristic, but every so often, like a broken clock, he does something uh, that's dovish. He does something that's right. He does something that's accurate. And then the mainstream media just piles on. Uh, so when he talked about withdrawing from Syria and Afghanistan, the mainstream media, led by the corporate liberal media, they just started attacking and saying, how, you know, it's one article after another, and Fair does a great critique on this. Uh, one article after another talked about how unrealistic that we would take out troops from Syria or Afghanistan. It's just not realistic. And so uh, you have a situation where the so-called liberal media is outflanking Trump on the right, certainly outflanking him in terms of hawkishness. And the more amazing thing, and Fair has an article at the top of its homepage now, is I don't know if people people may have missed this, but in December, Trump uh, had a meeting with President Xi in China, of China, and apparently went well. And he said, "We've got to do something about this arms race. Can you believe we're spending 716 billion dollars on on the military? Crazy," said Trump. And one article after another came out in the uh, middle of the road to conservative outlets saying how you can't cut the military budget. So uh, the, the odd thing is there are very few dovish Republicans. There are some dovish libertarians who I'm sure many of us in the peace movement have worked with. Um, but, uh, and you know, there's one website that we, I'm sure we all look at antiwar.com uh, which is a website uh, that's uh, sort of right or left as long as you're anti-war. So there obviously is some grounds for libertarian right and the progressive left to work on militarism issues, and it's been happening. Okay, great. Um, next up, Mark, Mark Maxey. If you can unmute yourself, you should be able to speak up. Is Mark here? Yeah, I am. I'm trying. There we go. All right. The question I have is for Joe. He was talking about you can't be a peace activist without also being a media activist. And for the last two months, I have shut down my Facebook and my Twitter feed only because it's just it's too capitalistic. And it was just you know, the protest that I had against Facebook was the use of selling my data, and I didn't like that. 
So I would like to ask Joe, if you're not using Facebook and Twitter, how can you be a media activist? Well, if you own a television, if you have a radio, if you go on the computer and check out news sources, you can be a, a media activist. And uh, I think it's healthy to disconnect every so often from media totally for a whole week if you can. But if you're doing peace activism, you have to know what the mainstream media are feeding the masses and you have to challenge it by providing independent news sources to your fellow citizens and by uh, organizing against and exposing mainstream media for its bias. Uh, so again, it's fine to disconnect from Facebook and disconnect from social media, but it's sort of hard to unplug from newspapers, magazines, the computer, TV, and radio. Okay. Um, Rose, let us know if you want to jump in as well. Otherwise, we'll um, go on to the next one. Um, by the way, I think you're, um, you have called him Joe, but it's Jeff, Jeff Cohen. Um, but okay, um, next is Kevin Howley. Kevin, you can speak up or I can read the question. Um, Kevin, are you here? If you can unmute yeah, yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, greetings to everybody who's participating in this uh, terrific webinar. Um, uh, Rose, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of hearing you speak before, but I'm, I'm really happy to um, hear what you have to say. And Jeff, I've been reading FAIR since I'm, uh, you know, in high school. Um, right. And it's really shaped both my uh, academic and my uh, personal politics. Um, so uh, I had a couple questions, uh, particularly about um, what we're seeing, particularly in the Trump administration with the breakdown of elite consensus that you sort of alluded to earlier. And this seems to be a really good opening, something that, uh, that the peace activists and media activists alike can really use as a wedge to sort of promote these kind of ideas about a bloated military budget, about, um, you know, the use of robotics and drones, um, the, the, you know, the escalation of tensions uh, with Russia and China. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? And perhaps to fold in a second question, particularly as it relates to, um, it seems the Trump administration has got its sights set on regime, regime change in Iran. And this is urgent, so we need to speak to this right now. Yeah, um, I, I think you're completely right that the, uh, the target is now Iran. It's very dangerous. Um, there is a fracture in elite consensus. And while I've emphasized how the Democratic Party leadership doesn't put up a fight, the great news in the US Congress is there's all these backbenchers who uh, are questioning the military budget, questioning U.S. Uh, policy in, uh, between Israel and Palestine. And uh, it's very exciting. So when I see that, when I think of the fracture of elite consensus, I'm thinking of uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, Ayanna uh, Presley. They all got elected based on a, a platform of cutting the military budget and taking that money and putting it to human and environmental uh, uses. And uh, David Swanson, who's no friend of uh, Democratic office holders, because he'd done so much research on how even the alleged progressives, they have, here's the 10 point program, I'm running for re-election, and they don't even mention foreign policy or the military. So the exciting thing is there's all these young Congress members and they had that as part of their platform. And then you have a couple who are second termers and my uh, uh, a hero is Ro Khanna uh, from California who led the fight to get the vote in the House on the US role in the war, the massacre in Yemen. So the exciting thing when I look at fractures in the government is the uh, new members of Congress or second term members of Congress that are trying to put militarism and endless war on the agenda. Because that's something that even Bernie Sanders, who I love him, I love his domestic agenda, he's weak on these issues. But there's a lot of young Congress members who are very strong on these issues. They wanna change Israel policy. 
they want to cut the military budget, and they're very explicit about it. From both uh, of you, Kevin and uh, uh, Jeff, what, what you mean by Iran being dangerous? And, uh, what, what do you see as the danger involving Iran? The fact that um, um, uh, sanctions uh, have been reimposed or... or no, no. The, the, the danger is, the danger I'm referring to is that that's where U.S. militarism has lined up. The Democratic leadership is in that direction, the, especially Pompeo and Trump and their alliance with Saudi Arabia and Israel. I was saying the danger is that that's the new target, that Trump, to make sure everyone understands I'm not a dove, can prove that by his uh, increasing bellicosity with regard to Iran, and it's very dangerous, and I know a world without war, world beyond war activists and other peace activists know that Iran is in the crosshairs. Thank you for clarifying that. I agree with you. Yeah. Do you have another question? Sorry, I, I was muted. Um, okay. So next up is Rich Fishkin. Rich, are you here? Um, I don't know if we can hear you. Can I? Can you hear me now? Yes. I you. Do I have to do this or what? I do? go for it. Just we hear start you. talking. Yep. Well, I'm a media. Um, was a media reform activist in Pittsburgh, and also a peace activist. So I um, take to heart what Jeff was saying. And I've had a very difficult time, almost impossible, getting peace activists to champion democracy now on our fraudulent community radio station here in Pittsburgh. We've got the Pittsburgh is such a media monopoly town. It's a classic case study on media monopoly with the Democratic uh, administration here in Pittsburgh. So the community stations wouldn't put democracy now on. They basically ran as fast as they could from it. And the local peace and social justice center didn't want to touch it, couldn't get behind it. You know, I have too many other things on my plate, you know, whether it's a, a, a transportation activist or a, uh, the fracking activists, that when I try to tell them that this is a, a meta issue and that it, uh, it's an umbrella issue that uh, is critical to every other issue, they just kind of roll their eyes and walk away. And these are seasoned activists that should know better. So I guess I'm asking everyone, uh, you know, some for some advice on this and yeah. the other thing that i want to say is that you never see a, a peace sign i mean a, a a media reform poster flyer sign championing pacifica democracy now alternative radio any of these great programs you never see any, uh, any sign like this at any of the demonstrations that Democracy Now! covers, uh, nationwide, local, I never ever see a media reform sign. And this just breaks my heart. And how do we deal with this? Just to keep things moving along, because we have at least uh, four more questions. So um, which one of you wants to pick that one up? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give a quick response. Um, I think the, the situation you're describing in Pittsburgh may be a minority situation because, uh, as I was saying, media activism, a big part of it is spreading and building independent media. And one of the most successful campaigns of the last 15 years has been people in city by city fighting to get Democracy Now! on the local public radio, on public TV access, on local PBS stations. And it's why Pub Democracy Now! has exploded. Um, so 
I, 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 I hear you. Uh, I don't doubt in any way that the frustration you felt in Pittsburgh, but let's keep in mind that if, if a big part of media activism is getting these, these news outlets or sources that are so much better than the mainstream media on war and peace issues and getting them to explode and grow, democracy now is a real success story. Uh, but, and your second point, when people are protesting and uh, their peace marches, justice marches, I love it when I see a democracy now sign. It's not enough, but I've seen them. Or I see people holding up a truth out sign or common dreams. Uh, it really is part of our peace and justice work is to build and grow these independent sources of news. Uh, uh, if you believe part of the problem uh, lies in the fact that young people are uh, turning away from traditional sources of news coverage. Uh, they're on YouTube, they're on the internet, uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, we might not um, think it's a good idea for, all, for reasons that have already been pointed out, but um, is this part of the problem? Is this uh, the, the, why the democracy now isn't getting uh, more attention in peace marches and, and among peace activists? Um, I don't know. For 10 years, I talked about journalism. I focused on independent media. And an increasing number of my students are very conscious of democracy now from the age of 18. It has grown in social media, it has grown on the internet. Obviously, it's also on TV and radio uh, across the country besides being on the computer. But the, the other news site that all of my young people knew about and know about that's fairly progressive is the Young Turks which is a web native, it's, it, you can't, you know, it's basically on the internet, it's on the internet and uh, it's on YouTube. Um, so, I mean, I'm excited by, I believe that independent media of a progressive, of a peace oriented nature is grown in the last 10 years. It's because of the internet. And when I look at Trump's attack on media or Trump's attack on free, freedom of the press, I don't worry that he occasionally insults CNN reporters, although that's atrocious. But the worst thing about Trump when it comes to freedom of the press is his Federal Communications Commission is working hand in glove with MSNBC's owner, Comcast, CNN's owner, Time Warner, uh, you know, it used to be uh, spun off now Spectrum. Verizon and AT&T, and they're all working to end net neutrality. If we end net neutrality, this boom in independent progressive media will come to a stop. Okay, so, um, oh, uh, Rose, are you speaking? Pardon? Oh, I thought you were speaking, Rose. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, I, uh, uh, I, I must admit I have some mixed feelings about uh, net neutrality, given the uh, uh, extensive coverage we've had on uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, the selling of our data, the invasion of our privacy. I, I just uh, uh, wonder how we uh, uh, contend with, uh, with the pirates uh, uh, involved in uh, um, uh, uh, compromising and our, uh, so much data, or the fake news, the, the extent to uh, which uh, and, and elections have been swayed. Uh, now, um, perhaps you believe this is not necessarily the case, but uh, it's, it's a fairly um, strongly held uh, uh, position that uh, um, we've had a lot of fake news that has uh, put the, the future of net neutrality in some doubt. Yeah, I guess my feeling is that there's always been right wing disinformation and fake news. That the the good news, way, you know, in talk radio, Fox News, way before the internet was strong, the internet has allowed independent media, progressive media, peace media to grow, and we can't allow Verizon, AT and T, Spectrum, uh, Comcast to uh, take websites that they disfavor or that criticize them, or that they don't own, or do not pay them well, and put them into the slow lane. So to me, uh, saving net neutrality and preventing these, these three or four giants from uh, shoving 
democracy now and the young Turks and common dreams and fare into the slow lane. That's one of the biggest fights that media activism is waging today. Okay, let's let's um, keep going. There, I, I don't know if it's possible, but I'd like to get at least three more questions in. Kara, Kana, and BLJ2 are all patiently waiting. So um, we probably should have only one person answer each one. Um, Kara, you're up. Um, can't hear you, Kara, you're muted. I'm trying to unmute, okay. Uh, I do ask, how can the Green Party Main Peace Initiative nationally be used to help or force Democrats to reduce the military, industrial, congressional, entertainment uh, com complex. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say that here in Canada, I have frequently taken this up with uh, Elizabeth May, who, who is uh, the leader of the Federal Green Party and uh, um, who um, uh, is elected uh, uh, to the House. And, and we also have uh, one Green Party member here in the province of Ontario now that uh, is very much on side um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, acknowledging the excesses of popular culture in ways that mitigate movement toward a sustainable future. Um, I, I agree that we need uh, a more independent news of one kind or another, but the, the incredible uh, um, amount of energy that's channeled into um, popular culture commodities and their use and is is um, simply not uh, sustainable and that uh, w when we talk about reducing reusing and recycling we have to make smarter choices about what is being produced and distributed for a host of reasons and uh, one uh, frequently overlooked uh, uh, component in this discussion is the the amount of energy that is used by um, uh, digital uh, uh, technologies of one kind or another greenpeace came up with a study in uh, 2014, I think it was, indicating that uh, um, if, if, if you look at the, um, the ways in which the internet and um, uh, electronic devices, digital devices of one kind or another are used, they are uh, more or less on a par with the airline industry. They're, they're, they're uh, behind the six largest um, uh, carbon emitters in the world, and uh, the five countries, uh, um, uh, the U.S., China, China, um, Russia, Brazil, and Japan. I think they, uh, those were the ones. So yeah, I mean, uh, and, uh, the, the uh, attempts to move to a sustainable future and addressing climate change, the Green Party has um, all over the world have to uh, uh, pay more attention to the um, um, explosion and um, uh, indiscriminate use of digital technologies. And then I haven't even said anything about uh, the World uh, Health Organization coming out, among others, uh, um, uh, uh, with research uh, demonstrating the, the harmful effects of the electromagnetic uh, emissions, uh, low-level radiation, it's sometimes called, which uh, doesn't um, help at all for healthy environments, especially for children. Yeah. Okay, um, we're going to try to fit two more in. Kana, you're next. Yes, thank you. Um, I am from Japan originally, and um, right now, and it's been a couple of years, more than a couple of years, but um, ever since that nuclear accident after the tsunami, Japan has become very, very um, dangerous. And PM Abe, Prime Minister Abe, is very um, much fascist and he wants to militarize the country and he wants to change the constitution. And as some of you may know, he's a Trump's pet. And um, he agreed to purchase so much weapons that many Japanese don't want to. And many Japanese who have been um, suffering with, uh, from the earthquake and uh, nuclear accident and adding all uh, left alone and it's becoming really, really dangerous. And um, he's got um, Japanese media under control. Fukushima is not under control. And he has 
our um, like NHK, which is equivalent to a PBS, completely like his propaganda channel. So the people who don't watch TV or, uh, I'm sorry, people who are not on the internet, they are not exposed to any truth and he's controlling the information very, very badly. So we are trying to run um, the petition through the, uh, with the people, um, just with the, one of the um, issue with the US military base in Okinawa. And we got the 200,000 people signatures, but um, how, how could we, I'm a amateur, amateur, I'm not a peace activist, but all the people who are amateur are, are trying to do something through the internet. So um, is there well, anything? Before Jeff or Rose jumps in, I just want to mention this is something we cover a lot at World Beyond War, um, Connor, so I hope you'll get in touch with us as an organization. Um, we're very involved with this, but um, Jeff or Rose, would you like to? Well. I mean, uh, World Beyond War is so important and often works with rootsaction.org, which is an online activism group that I co-founded with the peace at activist Norman Solomon. I just think uh, uh, things like Okinawa, if we're organizing here in support of them, uh, Roots Action does a lot of that in World Beyond War. There are a lot of activism groups working online to support people in other countries who are resisting uh, U.S. imperialism and U.S. military bases. Yeah, just to add on to that, this is Greta of World Beyond War. We actually have a Japan chapter based in Nagoya, um, and they travel to Okinawa frequently and communicate with Okinawa to support them. Um, so I encourage you to go to our website, worldbeyondwar.org, and you can find out ways to get involved locally. I put the link in the chat box um, to find a chapter near you and you can connect with our Japan chapter and support their efforts. Um, but two of our central campaigns at World Beyond War are weapons divestment and closing military bases, recognizing that the United States has 95% of all military bases around the world. I might just add that Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and Social Justice has maintained close ties with Japanese uh, uh, counterparts over the years. So you might want to um, link up with them as well. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I actually live in the US. Yeah. And, but um, would it be okay to post um, in the chat the, the petition link? Yes, please do. Thank you. Please do. And, and yeah, if you get in touch with us at World Beyond War, um, we'll, we will help and be involved with you on this as well. Thank you. Um, we're a little bit over time, but um, one person's been patiently waiting, BLJ2. Why don't we call this the last question? Yeah, so my name is Bridget. Uh, and uh, so my question kind of goes to wanting to get young people to think a little more deeply about um, technology and such. And I'm saying this as somebody who went to college, I was going to study to go into the oil and gas industry and took a class and I couldn't get into the extractive energy, extractive industry. So, um, and I know we have groups that go around trying to give alternatives for young people instead of going into the military, kind of giving all those kinds of alternatives when they're in high school. Um, and I have a friend who teaches computer science and she kind of puts ethics into it a little bit. But I'm wondering, um, for people going into, uh, you know, whether it be drone technology or if another friend of mine's daughter is going into uh, program gaming, that's what she's going to college for. But is there any um, effort to try to, um, I think this question is more for Rose, uh, have some accountability in these programs to have some some like an ethics class taught <laughs> alongside of this maybe perhaps also in media there's some some other support mechanisms that can be done for the the people in the universities studying those things too anyway that's my question just kind of goes toward um kind of balancing out and helping uh, folks think about this as they're going into whatever um into these industries 
good and important question and we don't have nearly enough time to deal with it because um, I, I, I know certainly here in Canada we've got community colleges and universities that are uh, drifting more and more into um, uh, an area where they're teaching uh, computer science and uh, I, I know one young dropout uh, who switched universities he was so disillusioned saying I didn't get, I don't want to go to university only to to um, develop computer games uh, or video games that's really what he he found himself uh, in a position of, of being taught and um, uh, uh, media literacy courses of course which have been championed and promoted for decades uh, and uh, uh, you go to the websites um, uh, here in Canada what the Ontario Ministry of Education is encouraging from K to 12 and on and it's um, um, yes understanding how media work but the the predominant emphasis is on how young people uh, should learn how to make their own programs and uh, uh, w without uh, an enough consideration of the, the critical aspects of where this is leading them or society at large. So I, I think there's a real need for more of that. <laughs> Okay, um, I think we're done. Greta, do you want to say any? Yeah, thank you everyone for joining tonight. We had over 100 participants and thank you Jeff and Rose for being our guest speakers. Thanks to Mark for moderating. Um, again, my name is Greta. I'm the organizing director of World Beyond War and I encourage you to visit our website worldbeyondwar.org to get involved with us. We have many chapters and affiliates, affiliated organizations around the world that you can get involved with or we can work with you to start your own local chapter in your area. And last but not least, we have another webinar coming up next month. Stay tuned for details, but we'll be focusing on NATO and the negative impacts of NATO around the world. And we'll actually be co-hosting that with Canadian Voice of Women for Peace that Rose mentioned earlier today. So thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.